Hi, and welcome to our end of April update from the Wealthy Doctor Institute, Intelligent Investing for the Busy Professional. We focus on simple, battle-tested methods of investing that require just one adjustment each month to protect and build wealth. I'm David Ye, author of my book, The Busy Doctor's Investment Guide, How One Adjustment Per Month Can Help Maintain Your Portfolio's Health. Although the strategies in this book are easy to calculate and adjust each month, for those who are new to concepts in this book, or for those who are new to investing in general, this video will try to clarify what I do every month. Feel free to follow along every month until you get the hang of it. And this month's video, we're going to cover the question or topic of the month, review the 20-month moving average signal, review the MRI adjustment for the month, and then remind to mind the 25% trailing stop loss system. We have different ways of mitigating risk in the markets. Whichever method you're using, make sure you follow the system. So the topic of the month is dealing with loans. I get so many people asking me how to deal with loans, specifically how to deal with student loans. Now, I'm not an expert in loans. There are many resources out there, uh, topics on loan forgiveness, types of loans, etc., etc. That's all beyond the scope of this video. However, there are also myths involving dealing with loans, which we can analyze using our Excel spreadsheet. And whenever people ask about dealing with loans, that's one question. A different question would be, how do you build wealth while still dealing with loans? So to look at this question, let's go back to this twin example. For those of you who've read my book already or seen my website, Imagine two twins, Anne and Beth. They both start out at 22 years of age. Anne starts saving $2,000 per year for six years into a hypothetical mutual fund that returns 12% per year and then doesn't save another cent for the rest of her life. Beth, on the other hand, saves for 37 years starting age 28. And at the end, they both have $1.2 million. Well, Let's look at this a little bit more closely. At the 28-year mark, the differences are so small, the thickness of the line of the graph eclipses the difference. And yet, that small difference made a huge difference in the portfolio. How much different? Well, let's say Beth started at age 22. In other words, she started at age 22, never missed a single payment for her entire life. We've gone twice as much, 2.4 million. Now think about this. The first six years payments were much more valuable than the remaining 37 years combined. So understanding this concept, let's take a look at how this one small difference early on makes a huge difference later on. Let's say we save $1,000 a year and invest 8% a year and at age 15 we see something nice for $29,000, which coincidentally is what we have in our investment account at this time. Well, we can go ahead and spend it, buy that thing, or pay off that loan, or buy that house, or whatever it is that we use that money for, and then use the next 15 years trying to cash back up again. Versus if we didn't spend to begin with, and we just kept saving and investing, Instead of only ending up with 29000 we would have had 122000 In other words, we would have made four times as much at the end. So that $29,000 purchase actually cost us almost $100,000. But let's say instead of spending all cash, I mean, let's say this was something necessary like house or car or student loans or something, and yes, we have to pay it. What if we stretched out the payments? And I'm using a mortgage as an example, but any type of loan, uh, let's say charges 4% interest. So if we spent the cash, we would have ended up 29,000 at the end. However, if we drag the loan out for 15 years, we would have ended up with $37,000.
So, note, now note, on a yearly payment on a 4% loan over 15 years comes out to around 2,600 per year. We're putting 1,000 per year, so in effect, we're taking money out of our investment account to pay for this loan. But even then, overall, the investment account does well. Now, this is the same principle that we'll look into once we look at retirement strategies as well. But in terms of loan management, this can be the difference between dragging out your payments versus paying up all at once. So, obviously, there are pros and cons whenever we think about doing one action versus the other. And here are some of the more common pros and cons. If you are able to actually invest the difference, in other words, when you make your monthly or yearly payment, what would have gone into investing, you subtract out the loan, you put the rest into investing. That may make sense. But if you know that you're going to spend money when you see it, like for instance, if you see that $29,000 cash in your investment account, if you know yourself, might as well pay off your loan first. Also, keep in mind, if your loan interest is about equal to or lower than your investment returns, go ahead and drag out your payments. However, if you have high interest loan credit cards, for instance, where it's very, very difficult to make 18% or whatever it is that they're charging credit card nowadays, might as well pay off the higher interest credit card first. Now the cons. If you anticipate fluctuating income over the life of the loan, so for instance, over a 15 or 30 year mortgage or loan repayment program, you're not sure if you're going to be keeping your job that long. It might be a good idea to attack that loan sooner rather than later. And there are many reasons why our incomes can fluctuate. There's increasing regulatory compliance, whether or not it's uh, Obamacare or CME or whatever. Insurance, and we're talking about both decreasing third-party pay payments as well as increasing our practice premiums, as well as whatever contracts we're stuck in our practice, as well as internal threats. In other words, our jobs aren't that secure. There are cases where hospitals have fired whole groups of physicians. And even your own group, you can have internal political squabbles, and that can destabilize the group and adversely affect the stability of your income. So, weighing your individual stability versus weighing what you might be able to get in the markets will give you a choice of whether or not you want to pay off your loan as quickly and as viciously as possible, or to drag out your loan payments. Having said that, let's go into our systems now. Remember, investing, we're trying to mitigate risk. If we can mitigate the risk, we manage to boost our returns. And in this case, the 20-month moving average system, it's a one rule system. You take the 20-month average price of the S&P 500 index, and if the index is above the 20-month moving average, we are relatively safe to stay in the markets, but if the index is below the average, then stay out. So this month, the VFI index, which is the S&P 500 index we use for this model, the closing price was $190.70 per share. The 20-month moving average was 186.02. So right now, our index remains above the moving average. Therefore, it's relatively safe to stay in the markets for this month. No adjustment necessary this month. Next system, the Monthly Rotation Investment System, or the MRI system. So this one, all we do is rank three different mutual funds, the S&P 500 Index Fund, the Emerging Markets Fund, and the inverse S&P 500 index fund. And you can get data from any of these free sites such as 
financeyahoo.com. Rank which one did the best, rank which ones did the worst, sell the worst 25% of your portfolio, and buy the top fund. So how does that work this month? If you take a look at last month's closing price versus this month's closing price for the S&P 500 index fund, the emerging markets fund, and the inverse fund, we see that it's pretty much flatlined for this month. But there is still a clear winner. The emerging markets went up almost a percent. The S&P 500 index went up only 0.37%, whereas the inverse fund lost 0.43%. So now that we know our winner, last month we were half in the index fund, one quarter into the emerging markets, and one quarter in the inverse fund. This month, the inverse fund did worse, so we're supposed to sell our inverse fund to buy the emerging markets fund. So we end up with roughly half emerging markets, roughly half index fund. And for those of us for last month, we were 50% in cash because remember, one inverse fund cancels out one index fund. Because we have no more inverse fund, we can be one half emerging markets one half index fund for this particular strategy for this month. Next system is the 1% risk trailing stop system where we use a 25% trailing stop on our stocks making sure that no one stock risks more than 1% of our portfolio. We've gone through this system before. Just a reminder that I can't tell you what your stocks are doing. You have to monitor your stocks. If you have an automatic 25% trailing stop loss system with your brokerage, great, but it's a good idea to monitor it anyway just to make sure that the stops were hit in case they were supposed to be hit. So here are the rules for the 1% risk trailing stop system. Limiting your risk to just 1% of your portfolio. You can buy up to 4% of your trading account of your stock and then immediately enter 25% trailing stop loss order for that one stock. If the stock goes up 33%, that means the trailing stop loss is now at break even where you bought it. You can buy another chunk of stock and make sure that you update your trailing stop loss order appropriately. So summary. There are different systems. Don't mix up your systems. We have our signals for what we need to do this month to follow the systems. And keep those questions coming. I know I talk to several of you personally every month, but for those of you who have only heard about me indirectly, maybe you've got a copy of this video forwarded to you by a well-meaning friend or colleague. Here are ways to get in touch with me. Seriously, drop me a line, give me a call, email me. Set up a console. A few of you who I've talked to, you know your stuff, you're fine. You know, I don't have to worry about you. But for some of you, holy cow, it's clear you need help getting your financial life in order. Don't be bashful reaching out for help. The more you delay, the more time is against you. So, until next month, invest safely.